we've all had that feeling that we're doing most of the work in the group, teaching to a bunch of upper-level biologists. I know that some of you are thinking about that time in freshman bio when you might have been doing a little more work than other people. In this lecture, we're going to discuss multi-level selection, Simpson's paradox, and why um, provisioning that amount of work was not only good for you and the number of other people like you, but also good for the people who cheated off of you, or just kind of surfed along. Describe why an offspring always should want more provisioning than a parent is willing to provide. Explain why and when siblicide can be adaptive, and define and compare hypotheses of why eusociality arose. Today's lecture is on multi-level selection. And, of course, some odds and ends of kin selection. The idea of multi-level selection is that natural selection isn't only on the individual, but it's on the group, the tribe. So, of course, we have Ayn Rand with her philosophy that what she wants, she gets, and what she wants, she takes. And there is no public good because there is no public. There is only those who have and those who will take it away to give it to others. And there is something to be said for Ayn Rand. But we have cooperation as well. So is there a benefit to being cooperative? And why do we see cooperation evolve multiple times? For an individual, it's maladaptive to be cooperative. Cooperative. Being selfish gets you all the gains. For a group, though, it can be adaptive to have people who are cooperative within it. And I say people, I mean bacteria, of course. So this is known as Simpson's Paradox. For each individual, it is better to be selfish. But for the group, it is better to be cooperative. So how does cooperative nature evolve? Let's say we have a bunch of these bacteria, and they have a frequency of this uh, of, of the cooperative allele is about 0.5. So it's 50 cooperative, 50 selfish. They mix them randomly, and these are all the ways you can mix them randomly. You'll notice cooperative individuals always have lower fitness in any one group than selfish individuals. They're putting all the work in, but they're not getting the benefits. However, the tribes with more cooperators have higher fitness for all the individuals. So that group made of all cooperators got a whole bunch more fitness in the group made of all selfish. What happens is after just one generation, the frequency of that uh, cooperative allele has gone up to 0.56 instead of 0.5. So that's an improvement. Then allow the frequency of cooperators to increase in every generation, even if in every single group, the selfish ones are the ones who are getting the benefits. We see this in a good example with the bacteria. So this is where we can see um, individuals who can permit, who can make this uh, antitoxin. It implies a cost to them, and they're going to have lower fitness if they make an antidote. So you give them just uh, growing them without the poison, put them to get put them together, and what happens is the ones who are making the anti venom, the antidote, are going to have a, a lower fitness than the ones that are not, the ones that are selfish. But the ones that are selfish. Are um, that they're going to be, of course, they're doing much better. They're getting the antidote from their neighbors. Now, if they're growing separately, then the um, the selfish ones don't grow, and the ones with the antidote grow. If they're grown uh, with poison together, though, then they all grow. So, if they're grown without poison, the cooperative ones do not do so well. The selfish ones do better. If they're grown with the poison separately, the cooperative ones do just as well, and the selfish ones do much less well. If they're grown with the poison together, then the cooperative ones, again, don't do so well, but the selfish ones do a little bit better. So this is actually one of those examples of the exact same thing shown above. The cooperative ones within the group don't do as well. But the paradox here is cultures that have more cooperators, the whole culture has higher fitness. You can see here the, uh, the starting frequency of cooperators going from light green, very few, to um, heavier green, which is uh, very many. Then uh, what you see is um, the relative growth of that culture on the y-axis here is going to be highest where there are the most cooperators. And of course, um, within the well, the change in the cooperative frequency, you see the change in cooperative frequency um, within each well, you see some negative amount of cooperative frequency. So again, the frequency of cooperators, it's bad to be a cooperator because you get overwhelmed with the non-cooperators, but the, the, the whole tube does better. And that's going to be over generations rounds of dilution each generation, the frequency of cooperators moves from 0.1 to about 1. So this is Simpson's paradox in action. Although in any one tube, it is not good to be a cooperator when there are selfish bacteria present. 
Overall, the cooperatives win. And this is why cooperative societies are, are adaptive. You know, it's better to be a cooperator in a group of cooperators than it is to be selfish in a group of selfish. So let's talk more about uh, cooperation conflict and children. Babies cry, and they cry to increase their own fitness. You can hear them screeching around upstairs and they're playing, but a baby will cry, it'll summon the parent, the parent will give a certain amount of provisioning, and the baby will then stop crying. Well, some do. Um, the parents are supposed to provide more for their offspring. Of course, offspring should be selfish. They should want more provisions. A baby that's going to cry for milk will cry every time it's the least bit hungry and work itself into a mad fury if it's just a little bit hungry. I'm a little peckish. Let me scream for three hours. I'm just a little bit wanting a snack. Let me sing you the song of my people. Uh, these, these make sense. The parents do want to provision their offspring. And I, can, I can't tell you how many times I've been like, I guess I don't really need this for dinner. I'll give it to my kids. Uh, that's just instinct. That's what we do. And I can't tell you how many times the kids have been like, can, can I please, please, please? Because they want more. We're both trying to maximize our fitness in this. Uh, the problem is uh, parents and kids fight sometimes over, over things. So yes, I've definitely had, I, I'm worried about my snacks upstairs, that the kids are going to steal all of them. Um, also, we think about uh, the provisioning as far as offspring and the number of offspring goes. <clears throat> Any Investment into an offspring is a benefit for the offspring, but any investment for the, into the offspring is also a cost to the parent. So it's a fitness benefit to the parent in provisioning an offspring. But what about a second offspring? The offspring loses their fitness. They actually don't gain as much if they, diver, if they divert resources from a sibling, but at the same time they gain a little bit. So there's really a balance here. So, you know, I've got two boys. It's a good example. You can probably think of them as little monkeys and think of me as a big monkey. Uh, having one offspring is good. So at that point, we have, you know, one offspring. The cost of parent is a relative amount. And um, if you take half of that cost, if you reduce that cost by half, you're actually going to get more, uh, more benefit for the offspring if they kind of take more um, fitness from the parent by making them wait longer to have kids uh, taking resources away from the other offspring. You know, they gain a certain amount more fitness, but you see how it kind of plateaus. At some point, the offspring is going to do fine. There's a maximum amount of benefits that an offspring can really get. Um, one interesting thing is that this is kind of the idea behind why, uh, why monkeys chase away their children after a certain amount of time when they want to have more children. is because otherwise, that little monkey wing is going, to, um, is going to tell its parent not to have more kids until they've reached that maximum amount of benefit um, well before that, though, they've incurred much more cost to the parent. So there is an optimal parental investment into the offspring. Um, and at some point, the parent chases the kid, kid away, has another offspring. This is beneficial to the parent because they have direct fitness and beneficial to the sibling because they get uh, indirect fitness. But sometimes siblings like to kill each other. Right, Romulus and Remus? Oh, yeah. Masked boobies kill their siblings. Blue-footed boobies do not. So if you look at the percentage of uh, siblicides, and you just switch the booby, net, booby eggs around, I mean, they can tell the difference between the parents, but not the eggs. If you put, um, if you take masked boobies and give them to masked booby parents, there's gonna be a lot of siblicide. Almost 100% of the time, one of the babies dies. If you take masked boobies and give them to blue-footed booby parents, there's still a lot of siblicide. It's in their genes. Um, but the parent, there, there is some nest transfer showing that the parents actually are intervening, but only the blue-footed booby parents. So there is a certain amount of genetics here. Blue-footed boobies are less likely to commit siblicide. There is a certain amount of environment here, nurture, really. The blue-footed booby parents are more likely to step in and stop any attempt at siblicide. And this really has to do with what is the optimal strategy. Uh, sometimes it's best to, you, you know you can only raise one offspring, so you start with two. It's the heir and despair kind of idea. And they might fight with each other. If they do, the stronger one will survive. No need to work, uh, no need to intervene. And that's kind of what's going on with this example of suicide. But then there's reciprocity. Reciprocity, quite simple is the risk of, uh, is, is an exchange of favors, but with a time gap between favors. And this is good to see with, uh, with monkeys that are going to uh, ask to be groomed, make a call, 
and uh, the collar, if it, the, the monkey is much more likely to move towards the other monkey making a call um, if they just got groomed. So if they threaten, they're much less likely to move towards. It's just reciprocity. You groom me, I'll help you. You threaten me, I, I might not help you. And this is complex because this is co more complex social behavior. Uh, there's a recent experiment actually showed that uh, dogs can understand this a bit better than cats can. It showed um, there, there was a woman and she was trying to open a can and she couldn't open it. So she'd ask someone for help and the dog would watch because dogs watch everything. And the dog would watch and the person would help that person open the can. The dog would accept a treat from the helper. If the person refused to help with the can, the dog would not accept a treat from the refuser. Cats, I mean, treat is treat, so why not? And that's the idea of not only reciprocity, but how this can impact greater social interactions. Speaking of greater social interactions, use sociality. Use sociality. It's the example here of convergent evolution. This is, we've seen this in wasps, ants, and naked mole rats, as well as in certain types of shrimp. Uh, leaf cutter ants are a really good example of this, where you have, as we mentioned in a previous lecture, you've got um, multiple generations taking care of the offspring and living together. Um, you've got sterile casts, and you've got one more thing, blanking. Ah, cooperative care of the young. So multiple generations living together, cooperative care of young, sterile casts. There you go. And they, you have that in both leaf cutter ants and naked roll rats. But don't confuse this with hive minds, where they all share some sort of psychic energy with one another. That, that's, that's not real. That doesn't happen. Each individual is still looking out for itself. So how does this evolve if it's better to be, um, oh, that's actually D. Um, if it's better to be selfish, how does eusociality evolve? My bad. D. So here's the example for naked roll rats. There's one reproductive queen, a few males that mate with her, but the rest of the colony has no fitness. Ah, indirect fitness, yes, but no direct fitness. The queen's very active and aggressive in preventing other females from trying to have offspring of their own. And her dominance ensures no other female will try to mate with the males, no other female is going to have offspring. Cool. That allows her to be the one having all the offspring, which means everyone's related to one another. So how does this work? Well, not just with, with the, this is not true for the naked mole rats, but it's true for some others. It's called haplodiploidy. This is one hypothesis. Males are haploid, females are diploid. The workers are 75% related to one another then. So they have half of their mom's reproduction and all of their fathers, if that makes sense. So worker that has offspring is gonna be only 50% related to their own offspring if they were to say half of their moms. So there's actually less gain from having their own offspring than there is from protecting their sisters. So save a sister's life, 75%. Have your own offspring, 50. Mm, there's, no, there's no question there where you're gonna get a greater amount of selection. And this is the idea that you get from the queen, her drones, and all of that. Another one is a monogamy hypothesis. It's kind of a cool one. So an individual can increase their fitness Taking care of siblings is 0.5, as much as by having offspring, 0.5. So assuming diploid, a queen and a drone have offspring, each of the offspring are 50% related to their parent, each parent. Each of the offspring are 50% related to each other. So what other factors of Hamilton's rule apply? Well, think about cost and benefit, too. If each individual in the hive or nest or whatever is helping, but not helping a lot, it's not costing them a lot, but they're 50% related, then why not? And let's, let's face it, it's easier to take care of your brother than it is to have a baby. That's kind of the idea here. Raise your brother versus have a new baby of your own. It can be better to uh, be part of a hive, especially if you're going to live together for multiple generations and everyone's cooperating, cooperating and caring for the offspring. There's no reason not to be a sterile cast. Boom. Use sociality. That's all I need. And there's ecology history. I like this one because it's, it's kind of a fun one. That use sociality evolved multiple times in wasps. So this is a convergent evolution within a single family tree. All wasps need to make a nest. They have to keep young. So this early on, you have this evolution of a haplodiploidy, so the possibility of this. Now I'm not saying all these are mutually exclusive of one another. 
Um, you also have these carnivorous larvae evolve early on. After that, you're going to start going to, you're going to start seeing um, it's more beneficial for the mother to take some other type of man, of um, path. Uh, you get the larvae that are actually um, kind of what is it I'd say legless. That's the word legless. They're immobile, which you would be if you're legless. So now the grubs can't really care for themselves. First thing that evolved was parasitism. So they parasitize insects, live inside them, and that way the, the larva can be uh, legless, immobile, carnivorous, it's a parasite really, and the mother doesn't have to take care, it just has to lay the eggs in an aphid. Uh, but the problem is nesting behavior evolved a couple times after this because, well, parasites began parasitizing each other, for one. Um, also, if there was high predation, it became really advantageous to guard the nest. So it's better to guard the nest and protect your sisters than it is to have your own offspring. So this is where we'd see uh, the communal fortress, fortress nest of the, of the ants and the wasps. So yeah, you see this actually evolve a couple different times. Yeah. All right, check it out, check it out for yourself. Should a tribe of cooperators outcompete a tribe of selfish individuals? Well, the answer is yes. Each one of them is going to be getting a greater benefit from each other. <coughs> You're all going to have better fitness. How can this be true, though? The co cooperator's fitness is always lower than the selfish individual's. Well, within group versus between group. Will you gain or lose fitness if you meet your children's demands? Oh, that's a balance. And why did you sociality arise? See previous slide. All right. Have a nice day.